technology. I'd like to welcome you to Why in the World Haven't We Cured Alzheimer's by Now? Uh, which we are presenting in partnership tonight with the Society for Neuroscience Chicago chapter. Uh, I also serve on the executive committee for the Chicago set of of the Chicago Society for Neuroscience and our president, Dr. Dorothy Kozelski, is in the audience tonight. Hello. Thanks for coming. Uh, this is uh, C2ST's first event at the Rattler, and I want to thank them for hosting us tonight. Uh, as you know, food and drink is available for purchase. It's delicious, and your server will be getting to you shortly if they have not thus far. Um, and I don't know how many of you have attended uh, a C2SD event thus far. Uh, if you're unfamiliar with us, we bring scientists out of the lab directly to you, mostly from national labs, museums, major research institutions, a um, variety of topics. There's postcards in front of you that tell you about some of our upcoming events. You can also find them on our social media channels and our website. If you're not on our mailing list, there is a uh, clipboard coming around that you can sign up to receive our emails. Uh, if you do like what you hear this evening, please consider making a donation. We are a not-for-profit organization. Um, you can see a C2ST representative or go on to our website to donate. Uh, I would like to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Grace Stutman. Dr. Stutman is an associate professor in the Department of Neuroscience at Rosalind Franklin University, the Chicago Medical School. She received her PhD in neuroscience from New York University and then completed postdoctoral research fellowships at Yale University School of Medicine and UC Irvine in the Institute for Brain Aging and Dementia. Dr. Sutzman, all yours. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for the introduction. This is really fun. Not only do I love neuroscience, but I love German food. I love beer. I'm so excited to be here. That's um, definitely my, my uh, comfort zone. I do want to start by begging. Does anybody have a laser pointer? No. Okay. Um, so we're just going to make do. I don't know how to do it. Okay. So we'll make do as best I can. Um, and the advancer for the slide to advance the slide. I have to go back to the computer. Yeah. Okay. There you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll definitely make this a, a team team event. Okay. So. Um, I've been working on Alzheimer's disease research for 15 years or so now, um, but my background really started in neurophysiology, trying to understand how neurons work, how neurons connected up to form memories, and then what happened when these systems went wrong. So I've worked in stress disorders, psychiatric disorders, even drug addiction, and I said that 15 years ago I started getting interested in Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in this process I realized it's an incredibly frustrating field. It's constantly changing. I'm sure if any of you even read the newspapers or listen to the radio, there's every so often some new breakthrough in Alzheimer's disease, and then it goes away. We're wondering, where are these cures? We know that the government is pouring a lot of money into researching Alzheimer's disease. Where are these outcomes? Where is happening in this field that we hear so much about? It's this impending disaster, and it seems like we've made no progress. So that's the sort of battle and thinking that I attack this disease with is how and why aren't we making progress and what can we do differently to make an impact. But to back up a bit, um, the fundamental problem is actually identified by you know, the ancient Chinese wise men who realized that man fools himself, prays for a long life, but he fears an old age. Um, and in, in the latter, we've actually done a spectacular job of increasing our lifespan. Um, so we've done this incredibly well, although we didn't think about it, or we didn't think it through very well, because if you um, look at the corresponding graph and the projected number of people with Alzheimer's and Alzheimer's-related dementia, um, we've actually you know, brought on this scourge upon ourselves. And if you look at this graph, this is where I need a laser pointer, um, we're only at the beginning of this inflection point. We're not even to the 2020 point. Uh, so if this trend continues, this increase in Alzheimer's disease, um, so it really will reach catastrophic proportions. And currently, um, there's something like five to six million people with Alzheimer's disease. I don't know what that means, but I can count to eight. And I realize, you know, I can re figure out what one in eight people over the age of 65 has Alzheimer's disease looks like. Um, that to me is a really terrifying statistic because there's a lot more than eight people here um, in this room. So 
Um, so just that's our background information. I really wasn't going to get a lot into like what Alzheimer's is, what causes it. Um, we don't really know, but I will just touch on there's two main forms. The one that most people are familiar with is the sporadic form, meaning we don't really know what causes it. The etiology is unknown, and it's still really only diagnosed at post-mortem when you actually look at the brains of these patients and see it filled up with plaques and you have to do a lot of staining and look at the cognitive effects. There's another form, the familial form. This is the genetic form that if you have mutations in presenilin, APP, you will get early onset Alzheimer's disease. And this is where you see it in families. And it, um, you know, just because you know, your mother or grandmother or sister or brother or grandparents had Alzheimer's doesn't necessarily mean you're going to get Alzheimer's in a sporadic form. If three out of your four family members had Alzheimer's at an early age, it's very likely it's this aggressive familial form. But I tell you this because the basic research we do, it's difficult to study sporadic Alzheimer's disease in the lab. We just can't sit around and wait for it to emerge. We use the mutations that we know cause early onset familial Alzheimer's, which once the disease starts, it's essentially identical. But we can use those mutations and those genes, insert them into cells, insert them into mice, insert them into model systems, and then study the disease. So that's actually how me and, and my lab, and there's actually quite a few people from the lab here, um, we study the disease. We use the mutations, express it in mice, in cell lines, um, in, in a variety of you know, model systems, and then study the downstream effects. And I'm interested in mechanisms. Um, and I highly encourage you, if you'd like more information on the symptoms, the background, the risk factors, to check out the um, Alzheimer's Association website. So that's that web um, page down there. Um, I did just, I will bring up risk factors. So the number one risk factor for Alzheimer's disease is age, and that's something you can't really do anything about. Family history, so it's that dreaded familial Alzheimer's form. And then there's also risk factors, such as APOE4 gene status which increases your risk, but is not necessarily a cause. Other significant contributing factors that you can do something about, um, previous brain injury. So other than after age, um, exposure to a previous brain injury, traumatic brain injury, is the next highest risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. So protect your heads, helmets on your kids, um, helmets out skiing, very important. Your cardiovascular health is important. Your education status, so there's this idea of, of um, you know, uh, re memory reserves. And also social and cognitive engagement is important um, in maintaining sort of memory function and memory uh, sort of resilience in Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so now we're gonna move on to a little bit more of what's going on in the field, where are we going, why aren't we going someplace faster, further. Um, so there's several current therapeutic targets that people consider for Alzheimer's disease. Um, the first is these beta amyloid plaques. It's probably what you hear most about. It's talked about most in the newspapers, in the literature, and even in the Alzheimer's research. It's one of the earliest diagnostic, or at least um, highly relevant features in Alzheimer's disease. And it's the sticky protein that builds up in the brains of Alzheimer's disease patients. Um, next are these neurofibrillary tangles. These form inside of cells, and it's literally that. It's these proteins. Um, that become misfolded and they literally tangle up the inside of the cell and prevent the trafficking in the cell, sending things forward and back in the cell. Um, and it impairs and eventually the cell dies. There's also cell loss in the cholinergic cells, which is important for memory and attention, where the earliest ones to die off. And then there's also synaptic loss. Um, synapses, I'm gonna spend a minute explaining what this is. Um, synapses are the point of contact between two neurons. So neurons don't actually really physically touch. They communicate across this junction called a synapse, and it's pretty small, but it, the presynaptic, the first neuron, releases a neurochemical that triggers a response in the adjoining um, neuron, and it happens at this synapse. And the synapses are really important because that's where things like learning and memory occur. So strengthening of these synapses is associated with an increase in learning. A weakening of these synapses is um, it's not necessarily a bad thing, but it's, it's sort of the, the release or the with loosening of um, associations between two events. So the structure and the function of these synapses is very, very important for how ne neurons communicate, how memories are formed, and how stable memories are retained. So you lose these synapses, you'll lose your memories. 
So if we look at this in context of, I'm sorry, one more? One more. Thank you. Um, so currently, beta amyloid as a target is far and beyond the, the um, sort of the main target people are looking at in Alzheimer's disease. However, all of the drugs targeted or designed to reduce or clear beta amyloid have all failed rather um, very disappointingly in clinical trials. If we next looked at neurofibrillary tangles, um, the association with neurofibrillary tangles, the, it's a little less clear, it's still a late stage feature of Alzheimer's disease, but I believe actually, you know, this, this tau pathology um, is actually a critical factor in the Alzheimer's disease process. And if we look at cell loss, um, particularly cholinergic cells, this is an area where most of the current drugs are focused. It's over $4 billion a year is spent on this drug class to try and at least stave off or, or reduce the onset of Alzheimer's disease. And then lastly, for synaptic loss, this is the one feature of Alzheimer's disease that correlates with the amount of memory loss. So you, know, you lose more synapses, you lose more memories. Um, Whereas A beta and memory loss aren't correlated, tau pathology and memory loss is more loosely correlated. Um, cholinergic cell loss, again, that's just sort of a band aid we're putting on there. But synaptic loss is the only thing that correlates strongly. And it makes sense. Synapses are where memories are formed and stored. So if you lose your synapses, you'll lose your memory. It's a, it, it, I didn't think it was that hard of a concept. Um, so current treatments for Alzheimer's disease, you may have heard some of these drugs on commercials, um, in papers and magazines. Um, the cholinesterase inhibitors have been around the longest, and they do have some short-term benefits, um, but they're not a cure. And then the newer class of drug called memantine, that actually blocks a type of re receptor in the brain that's involved in many, many different activities. But it, it seems to have some short-term effects as well. Um, but again, these don't treat the underlying disease. Ultimately, these patients, given these medications, will likely fall to the same level of memory decline as, as an untreated person. So it just sort of delays the disease, but ultimately you wind up at the same amount of cognitive decline. So our lab is really focused on trying to develop new strategies that are actually getting at the cause and the mechanisms of the disease. And to try and do this, we're trying to protect synapses. I'm going to back up a second because um, I can always tell when there's a new, a new article, a new um, treatment, a new splash about something in the media because I'll get a call from my parents or my neighbors um, or my friends' parents about, oh, is this true? You know, is this really going to cure Alzheimer's disease? And you know, what are you going to do now? You'll be out of a job. Um, so. Um, Unfortunately, I still very much have one. Um, so I was just kind of kind of click through quickly some of the like crazy headlines and, and trends and things that get like perpetrated, um, perpetuated through the media, and this gets validated through a variety of sources. So some of those are more like you know um, less seriously taken uh, pieces of literature, but even the New York Times and the you know Wall Street Journal will often come out with some exciting trends and then it goes away. And so I encourage you to sort of think of these things critically um, about you know, these headlines that come out but then quickly are, are um, proven to, to not actually work. And so the most recent example is this compound that I said again, this made a, a really big splash not too long ago. Um, and I said again, I was getting Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Chicago Tribune, all these newspapers from all my you know, friends and friends' parents. Um, around the country about, you know, this is it, this Solanazuba from Eli Lilly is going to be our new cure for Alzheimer's disease. And we were all very much um, waiting on pins and needles to hear the outcomes of these clinical trials. And it was promising all sorts of benefits. So one study was even talking about how it was a 34% or decrease in the memory loss of these 80 patients. I mean, that's phenomenal. That has never occurred, um, at least in any sort of clinical trial before. And an enormous amount of excitement um, building up about, you know, finally a potential, at least effective treatment for Alzheimer's disease. But then, um, you know, not too, so November 2nd, we're within, you know, Alzheimer's treatment within reach. And then November 23rd, this drug fails. And it not only failed once, it failed twice. They sent this drug through two rounds of clinical trials. Um, and each time it failed. 
And it didn't fail in the way you think it did. It was targeted towards clearing beta amyloid, and it, in, in drugs like it, actually cleared beta amyloid fairly well. Um, what it didn't do is have any effect whatsoever on cognitive function or memory function. So there was a dissociation between the ability to clear beta amyloid in the brain and affecting the rate of memory decline. A lot of this damage is already going to be done. You can't reform a synapse and generate, get that memory back, but you'd hope that the rate of memory decline would change. And we haven't seen that in any of these strategies. Um, and it's, this isn't the only one. I didn't need to pick up on that drug. It's just the most recent one. I figured you may have heard of it. Um, but if you look at the whole you know, gamut of re fairly recent um, clinical trials, and I sort of color-coded them by target, and you see, unfortunately, they have all failed. And this has been at the cost of billions of dollars in clinical trials. And all the blue ones are the drug compounds targeting a beta or its, its sort of metabolites. So it's gener generating a lot of frustration among some of us that, hey, there, I understand why a beta is considered a target by some, but it has really nothing directly to do with memory. And don't we want to preserve memory? And as someone who studied memory mechanisms for many years and is a graduate student in my early postdoctoral training, why isn't anyone going after synapses, directly targeting synapses? So that's exactly why what we're trying to do. And we're frustrated with some of these problems. Why are we stuck? Um, and so I'll address some of this later, so I'll move on to some of the more interesting things. Um, and as far back as 1991, so this was a really great um, study put up by a group at uh, the Salk Institute um, that identified in human brains that synaptic loss, synapse loss, remember these key areas where two neurons connect and communicate and form memories, the synapse loss is the major correlate of cognitive impairment. Um, and this is 26 years ago, and so it, it still needs, I guess, needing validation. And so we spent actually a lot of time working in this area. Um, so uh, our lab, and then hopefully notice some of these faces here, um, we're interested in developing novel strategies to prevent Alzheimer's disease by targeting these early mechanisms, um, particularly of synaptic loss. We want to get there before the permanent damage is done, and we want to go after the main memory mechanisms, the, the actual structures and, the, and the, the processes by which memories are formed. Okay, and we have some pretty fun tools we like to play with, which I think also makes us a little bit different, our approach different from sort of mainstream Alzheimer's um, research in that we're interested in, actually, so this little black and white figure on the far left, we're looking at an actual living brain slice. Now it's from a model organism, so here it's, we're using mouse models of Alzheimer's disease. But we can actually work with living neurons, and that little, um, it's actually our patch pipette that's attached to it. We can, we can sort of listen in and actually control and play with this neuron. We can make it do things like fire action potentials. We can fill it with dyes that like light up when, when certain signaling cascades are going on. Um, so we can make it talk, we can make it dance, we can make it sing, we can watch what it's doing, we can see synapses, we can image what's going on in synapses as it's happening. And we're doing that with some of this, this uh, custom built two photon um, microscopy systems. And we've got some other photo caging mechanisms to target and, and release certain compounds and drugs. So it's a way to manipulate neurons and networks and synapses, and then in real time, listen in and see what's going on. And often our main readout is um, an ion called calcium, which I'm sure many of you or all of you have heard of, but you're probably thinking of it in the context of bones um, and, and the main you know, formation in, in bone strength. Um, and that's you know, bound calcium, usually calcium phosphate. Um, in, in cells, and in neurons in particular, calcium is a free ion and it's floating around, but it is a critical signaling ion. It controls everything from gene transcription, turning on proteins, um, cell depth, and then most important, let's get back to the point, you know, synaptic signaling is entirely controlled by calcium. Something called synaptic plasticity, or the ability to strengthen synapses and form memories, is entirely controlled by calcium signaling. And you don't mess with it. Too much, and it's not a good thing, not enough, and nothing will happen. So the cell is exquisitely tuned to control just the right amount of calcium for just the right signaling to do just the right thing. Don't mess with it. And we found 
um, in our AD models. Um, I'm sorry, this will be fun. Um, so can you click on the neuron on the left? Sorry. Okay, so what I'm going to show you is I showed you that system that we use. So we do patch clamping, we do two-photon imaging, and then we can fill the cell with stuff to image calcium signals. So what I was going to show you is that this is a normal cell. And what you'll see is that calcium level bubbling in the background, and then I'm going to release calcium from these stores, and it gives you this calcium release signal. So it kind of goes from like blue and green, and on the right is our Alzheimer's neuron, and you'll see now it shoots red. So that's indicating that there's way more calcium being released um, in the Alzheimer's neuron on the right than the normal neuron on the left. And so that's an example of type experiment. But if you go to the next one, you'll see a static image. Okay, and this has already been shown in actually human cells do this. So the top is um, actually human uh, skin cells, but from an Alzheimer's patient um, with the familial form. And that top bar shows that there's more calcium being released. We can also take these genes, put it into like oocytes, like frog oocytes, before they become tadpoles, and release the calcium. And we can see there's more. So this is related to this gene mutation. Um, but if we go back to our mouse models that we're using, and we can image within individual compartments, the soma, which is sort of like the main body of the cell, it's the factory of the cell, we can image calcium released from this compartment. And here, calcium is doing things like turning on genes, activating proteins. Um, so on the, the left two bars, the black bar is what a normal calcium response should look like. The red bar is the calcium response we get from our Alzheimer's mouse model. And I should point out, these are relatively young mice. This is before they're showing amyloid or tau pathology. This is before they have memory deficits. They seem completely fine, other than you start seeing this very significant calcium deficit. Um, even more um, relevant for memory is the two bar graphs on the right. This is the image from the, those dendritic spines where we said we can image what's going on in synapses. And on the, the little black bars, you get just a little bit of calcium in our control, in our normal animals, and it should be just a little bit. But that huge red bar is the amount of calcium being released in synapses in our Alzheimer's models. Um, so it's not even just a little bit. I mean, this is 10 to 15 fold increases in the amount of calcium. So this is really profound. And I'm like, oh my god, how do these mice even think? Like their synapses must, just be, must be exploding. But brains are really good homeostatic machines, meaning if you push them a little bit in one direction, they'll find a way to push back. They like to, they're very good at maintaining a certain output function. So these mice are acting okay, they seem fine, but if you drill down and look at the, like the most minute, you know, minute parts of memory signaling, you're starting to see the seeds of profound abnormalities prior to anything else. Um, and if you hook up all of these synapses, and all of these cells, how memories form is through these networks, right? So it's not just you know, one single synapse. It forms these brain networks. And it's really how these networks come together and communicate that memories are encoded and, and stored. So we're not the only ones that are thinking along this pathway. Um, so Dr. Lee Huixai um, also is looking into how network abnormalities are related to um, memory deficits and Alzheimer's disease. So um, I was showing you calcium signaling abnormalities and signal synapses. How would this translate or does this transform into these network deficits, right? So if you hook up all of these cells and synapses together, in, in parts of the brain that are important for encoding memory. So this is the hippocampus. Um, what happens? What does it look like? So that's kind of what our lab does. We, we look at things. So we teamed up with Bill Frost, who's the chair of cell biology and anatomy at Rosalind Franklin University. And he has some also very cool imaging toys. And we can take slices of the hippocampus, and it kind of looks like a squished jelly roll, but it's really this cool network of, of, of um, cell pathways. Um, that make it look like that. And we can pick a single spot and stimulate it and then look at the whole pathway response to that, that whole segment of the hippocampus. And again, the hippocampus is the part of the brain that's critical for like learning, memory, where you put your keys, where your car is, um, recalling all those sorts of declarative memories. You need this network uh, circuit. 
So if we go to the next slide, so what I have here, two more videos. The one on the left is the network of a normal mouse. Um, and what we're doing is we're gonna stimulate that one little spot and you saw it quickly um, depolarize or react to the other parts of the hippocampus and then it goes, it goes on, not quite yet. Um, so I don't know if you caught that well enough. I don't know if you wanna play it again. Um, we'll do it one more time to kind of So we stimulate, it, it, it actually projects all the way to another whole part of the hippocampus and then it actually reverberates around. So that's what a normal circuit response should be. If we look at that same exact stimulate, oh, back. Play Alzheimer's number two, there you go. This will click, there you go. We stimulate, nothing really happens, and then it gets stuck and spins around. Um, so there is an entire blunting of this network. So we go to the next one. Um, I just kind of laid it out for you over time. So this group over here is our control. You can see how it spreads around. On the right, the Alzheimer's, nothing really happens until the end, and it's really what those that little like areas of activity. It's just kind of spinning around. It's actually stuck in the circuit. Um, it doesn't make it out. That's just where I stimulated. So we now, not only do we have, again, these are these young mice. They seem to be behaving fine. Um, there's no amyloid yet. There's no tau pathology yet. There's no major memory deficits yet, although there's some little ones. But you're not only seeing now like these cellular deficits where the synapse of the cal you know, synaptic calcium is really, really high, you're seeing these like really bizarre network blendings. You know, it just gets stuck. It can't, it can't make it through the circuit. Um, so we found, again, this to be a really um, frightening um, mechanism because it's before there's any intervention, um, at least in what the human correlate would be. Um, we, you know, we haven't started treating people at this stage yet, but it's presuming there's something like this going on in, in the human brains. Okay, so we can say that this increased calcium, and we're looking at it's RYR because it's the ryanidine receptor, but I won't bore you with that unless you really want to know more. Um, if, if this massive increase in calcium is underlying this larger, more global deficit, can we do the opposite? And instead of triggering it, can we suppress it? Can we bring it back to normal? And thankfully, there's some existing drugs out there that do this already. They're intended for a different target. They're actually intended for your skeletal muscle. They're muscle relaxants, essentially. But it targets the same general class of receptor. So what happens if we take that drug, it's called dantrolene, and give it to our models, give it to our cells, give it to our mice, and what does it do to the calcium signaling pathway, and then how far down the Alzheimer's cascade does it go? Like, you know, how many things can we fix or correct by targeting this one pathway? So, um, just briefly here, I'm going to run you through a couple of our, our uh, studies, and Shreya here is actually is responsible. You can give her a big round of applause, and thank you for these studies. Um, we spent a lot of time on this. This is a, this is a, a long series of experiments. Um, so we treated our mice, and then just to, so to sort of summarize, that tall bar, that's the bad calcium that I was showing you. So we're just giving our mice a, um, a, a saline, because you have to give them something. You can't not treat them. And then the little bar to the right is our dantrolene treated Alzheimer's mice. That little bar is the exact same amount of calcium being released in our control animals. This is what it's supposed to be doing. So the two little bars on the left, that's what the calcium signal is supposed to look like. And I was pretty darn excited about the results in the Alzheimer's mice, right? We can take that huge calcium signal, bring it back to where it's supposed to be. And I did a happy dance for a little bit. And then I actually thought about like, who pays attention to the control group? They're normal, they stay normal, so what? And I was like, oh my God, that's the perfect drug. It takes something abnormal and it fixes it. But if it's normal, it does nothing. And I did like a whole bunch of happy dances. We were like, oh my god, I just cured Alzheimer's disease. And then I'm like, no, it's for muscles. It really doesn't work well in the brain. And there's a variety of other reasons. So it's a great tool and proof of concept. But it's not great for giving as a, a, something to treat a brain disease. So um, we actually also look at a variety of other things. Um, this is now looking at synaptic structure. So it's different than the type of experiments I was showing you earlier. These are sort of in, in, in fixed tissue. But we can measure, we can sort of um, make the one side of the synapse red, and we can make the other side of the synapse green. And since we're doing fluorescent microscopy, where it's actually like glowing, it's fluorescent, 
When they're combined and they're close enough, they make yellow. And that's a synapse, they're close enough. So what we're doing is measuring the amount of yellow, the amount of intact synapses, because you need them to be touching or near each other for them to be functional. And in our dantrolene treated saline, uh, saline mice, we lose these synapses. And we treat them with this calcium channel inhibitor, we get our synapses back. And again, in the control animals, it does nothing. It seems boring, but it's actually one of the most profound outcomes of the study. Um, similarly, we, we, we're interested in amyloid. Now we're looking at older animals. But what happens if we treat older animals? Does it restore the calcium? Yes. Does it restore our synapses? Yes. But we also reduce our amyloid by about 50%, which is relevant. I don't think amyloid is irrelevant in the disease process. I just think it comes on later, and there's things happening beforehand that need to be stopped first. And you may not recognize this, but this is memory encoding. Um, so it's one of the ways we look at circuits and synapses um, in the hippocampus. It's something called uh, long-term plasticity. And the, the, what you need to pull from this graph is when synapses are strengthened, that bar should go up. And the bar that's going down on the left, that's in the Alzheimer's brain. So it's going down, synapses are becoming weakened, but when, in our drug-treated animals, we get our synaptic strength back, it goes back up. So this, you know, targeting this single calcium pathway restores normal calcium signaling, but gives us our synaptic structure and our synaptic function back. Oh, and oh, it also really seems to be reducing amyloid pathology, which we're very excited about. Um, so why don't we put dantrolene in the drinking water? Um, you know, for some of the reasons I was explaining before, it's not a good drug for a brain target by itself. So about four or five years ago, uh, Rosalind Franklin University um, opened a college of pharmacy. And some of their first hires were two medicinal chemists with expertise in calcium channels and Alzheimer's disease. I mean, they couldn't have dropped out of heaven any, you know, any better than that. Um, and I went over their study, showed them the structures and the molecules, and said, can you make me a drug that does this, but targets a brain receptor, not a muscle receptor? I'm not a medicinal chemist. I have an enormous amount of respect for those that are. All I know is they came back up a couple weeks later with a bucket of, of vials. And we ran a bunch of them. And um, I won't run you through every one. We've run hundreds of them by now. But basically, we're looking for drugs that um, take that black bar, and that's sort of too much calcium, and brings us down to where the red bar is. That's where we want to be. And then we scoop out all the drugs that give us a profile and reduce it, the calcium response, to where we want to be. And that's the initial screen. And then we do quite a bit of others. So if Stephanie wants to raise her hand and say, hi, that's going to be her new job um, in the lab, helping to screen a lot of these compounds and relevant and cell types. Okay. Um, and because we wanted to accelerate this and actually put a lot more emphasis and move the process through faster, we opened up a, a small um, biotech startup company. So Glenn here, my, not only is he my projectionist, He's also president of Neurolucid. Um, yeah, big hand. Absolutely. Um, the medicinal chemist, John Bolowini, he's actually been outstanding in helping to develop and optimize these compounds. And Bob Moore, I'll talk a lot more about him in a minute, so I'll just hold off on that, but he's also an integral part of the whole process. Okay, so um, I'm gonna fast forward through this a little bit more quickly, because now hopefully you've got sort of the, the general, what we're looking for, how things work, what we're looking for. We go back to our Alzheimer's mice, Okay, and we give it, we pick two of our favorite compounds of the month. Um, so that big tall bar in the middle, that's the, you know, the, the bad calcium response in our Alzheimer's mice that we're trying to reduce. The two smaller bars on the left, these are animals that we just treated for four weeks with some of these compounds and it brought this calcium response back to normal. And thankfully in our control animals, we're not seeing much of a response. So we think we've been able to sort of replicate what we liked about that dantrolene compound, but made something that gets into the brain much more efficiently and targets those brain receptors rather than the peripheral receptors. Also, we're again looking at the top, we're looking at phospho tau. Here we have it stained in red. So on the left is the, you know, the untreated um, Alzheimer's mice, and the amount of phospho tau is shown in red. And then on the right is our drug-treated mice, and there's essentially no phospho tau left. So that's what formed those neurofibrillary tangles in the brains of um, ED patients. And similarly, the beta amyloid staining on the bottom, on the right, you can see it's markedly reduced in the brains of these, um, of these Alzheimer's animals. Um, and this is really exciting to us 
you know, as scientists, we love to understand mechanisms and what's going on and just trying to picking and teasing things apart. Um, but in all honesty, like we, we've already eradicated Alzheimer's in mice. I mean, all of the drugs that have been made into clinical trials have done much of this. No one really looked at calcium signaling, but it's clear the amyloid, it's clear the tau, and it's, it's you know, done wonderful things in clearing a, a, you know, a humanized version of uh, Alzheimer's in a mouse. Also in frogs, you know, we use a lot of oocyte models, C. elegans, worms. It, it's great. So let's see if this works. Can you press the little sound button? In so many words, this is all done before. Um, so we're really not doing anything that that new in terms of advancing a therapeutic. We may have identified a new kind of cool target and something that's more synaptically related, but we haven't gotten through the hurdle that probably stopped all those other drugs uh, beforehand. Um, but one of the big issues is that one of the main screening hurdles you have to get over is, you know, these are really tested in mice. So the ironic thing about um, mouse models of Alzheimer's is mice don't get Alzheimer's. Um, we give them human mutations and they get the features of Alzheimer's, such as beta amyloid, but then we give them drugs that are directly targeted to beta amyloid. So it's like we put something in there, and then we take it out and say, oh my god, it worked. Um, so what about using a model that's more clinically relevant, that has more to do with actual humans? Um, so here I'm bringing in, I figure we could probably use a little levity if I'm getting too technical or, or uh, going on too much about my um, science. So this is sort of a poke at my uh, friend and colleague, Bob Moore. He's actually the gene jock. Um, and what that is, is, is an affectionate way of saying he's an excellent molecular biologist. He can um, ma manipulate genes, express them in cells, turn uh, some types of cells into other types of cells based on their genetic makeup, and control it. So this is an incredibly powerful tool um, for those of us that want to study a human disease and use human neurons. Um, so what he's able to do is take um, and this is certainly a growing field. He's by no means the, the first or the only, but he's worked in the lab that developed this and has really mastered these techniques very well. Um, he can take human skin cells, he can take your skin cells, um, culture them in the lab, add his magic powders to them, which are really a bunch of genes and viral vectors and things and growth hormones that turn certain things on and off. And he can transform these human skin cells into human neurons. And you can do it directly, so all the epigenetics, all the stuff that's controlling the DNA and the genes, and that makes it unique to that, that individual or that disease, largely stays intact. Um, and then what he can do is then give it to us. Um, so, there you go. So the top is actually sort of showing his progression, how he's converting skin cells into neurons. Um, thankfully, our labs are right next to each other. So his cell culture room is right next to our recording room. Um, so John over there, I think these are actually some of, uh, actually Clark, um, really coming up next. Um, we can then patch on, like I was showing you earlier, we can attach a little electrodes to these cells. We can fill them with dyes. We can make them, you know, um, uh, generate action potentials and all these electrical and neurochemical signaling pathways. And we can test to see, are they really acting like real neurons? And so far they seem to be. And perhaps most importantly in terms of um, drug screening and even just understanding disease mechanisms, right? Because we clearly don't have a handle on that for Alzheimer's by any stretch. Like what's actually driving the disease? We have no idea. Um, so uh, compound studies such as this can hopefully uh, let us gain some new insight. So what we're seeing here is far left is our um, neurons and we're patching onto them. So those are, you know, if you hadn't seen a real human neuron before, that's what they look like, very exciting. Um, we can fill them with dyes and then those traces that you're seeing, the top one is this calcium signal from a normal aged neuron. Down below it is from an Alzheimer's patient of roughly the same age, but again, you're seeing this massive increase in the amount of both calcium. So this was like a fundamental starting point we needed to establish because there's no point in using these human neurons as a model if we couldn't, we didn't see the same pathology. You know, all we did was identify something weird about a transgenic mouse and then we end there. So this is critical to establish. And this is what John McDade um, has been doing in the lab, is generating this. And then this little bar graph um, 
the amount of calcium on the left, the amount of calcium in a normal neuron, middle is the amount of calcium in our Alzheimer's neuron, and then, like I was showing you earlier for the mice, the little bar on the far right is that same Alzheimer's neuron, but now targeting that calcium channel, and again, it brings it back to the normal. So again, showing the source is the same, the mechanisms are still largely in play. We can now build circuits and start looking at how synaptic transmission and deficits are occurring, and then use it as a screening tool to say, hey, are, are, can these compounds, or can targeting this channel, is it our, any, any, any compounds, by targeting this channel, or well, how can we preserve synaptic function in these human networks of Alzheimer's disease? Okay. And then I'm just going a little off topic, but it was more for, um, I, I'd love to take questions, I'd love to obviously talk about this stuff. Um, we're also working on similar models with uh, traumatic brain injury, where we're seeing very similar types of therapeutic effects. So in a traumatic brain injury, a lot of the same pathology emerges as we see in Alzheimer's disease, which are amyloid and tau, and even calcium signaling abnormalities. So what you're seeing on the left, that sort of bright green splodgy things, those are plaques in, in vivo, or imaging through, um, in, in an intact animal, um, imaging um, in its brain. And only three days after a brain injury, you're seeing these plaques emerge. But if you treat with some of these compounds, so it's only going to be three days of treatment, it completely eradicates you know, any, any of the pathology that we've been able to um, identify. As a matter of fact, we had to keep going back and making sure our microscope was working because we saw nothing. Um, so we're also working on some Huntington's, related Huntington's disease projects. Um, so I figured I, I kind of blathered on for, for quite a while. Um, so I just wanted to leave you with more of a, um, right now we're working on cures, not just myself obviously, but many labs and hopefully new, new approaches doesn't have to be calcium, but something that's actually driving the mechanism of memory loss, I think, is, is a much more productive um, and innovative way to go. Um, for now, I recommend for all of you, actually, social engagement is really important. Um, certainly physical exercise. I mean, all the things you learned in kindergarten, healthy eating, mind games. Um, let's not forget that, um, which has actually been scientifically proven. And, and um, I also want to just offer to some, any of you that are interested in helping or promoting or advancing um, any of our efforts, uh, by our, I mean the entire, you know, all researchers in, in clinicians in Alzheimer's disease. There's these sites you can go to, so the NIH has a program, if you're interested in volunteering in clinical trials, they need anyone, you know, healthy age controls, healthy young controls, um, if you have any sort of, you know, even diabetics actually make it very, because there's a, relation between Alzheimer's disease and, and diabetes, they think. Um, so if you're interested at all in contributing and you're like, well, I'm way too healthy, that's great for you. You can still help. Um, certainly educate yourself, but definitely go with the um, trust but verify approach. Um, the Alzheimer's Association is an outstanding resource from everything from helping to get help for caretakers to helping to defer you to um, people that can properly diagnose you treatment open 24 hours a day I was given a wonderful tour of their facility not too long ago and they're a 24-hour call line it's it's you know don't don't hesitate to call them for for any questions you may have and also just support research um support trials and try and get this field um, moving and as i said there's i think we're hopefully going to be making some changes in the way we approach therapeutic strategies in Alzheimer's disease. We just need to, to push it through the, the validation and, and getting some good compounds out there and try. Uh, so lastly, I just wanted to send out some thank yous. I do need to do this. Um, in particular, Rosalind Franklin University, they've been immensely supportive of, of my, um, my program and my research. In particular, Ron Kaplan has dipped into his personal research funds to help get, he actually uh, funded the first round of the, the drug trials. Um, with the new uh, chemist because we didn't have any funding. So he believed in us, he gave us some money to get started and we've actually been doing well and funding from the Alzheimer's Association and some other, uh, and NIH as well. Um, and also Neurolucent Smart Health, which is the uh, sort of accelerator that, that helped get Smart Health off the ground and all of our supporters. And certainly also all the funding mechanisms that have been supportive. Um, and last but hardly least, um, Whenever I said, you know, I, I meant we, but really when I say we, it's, it's them. Um, so yeah, I, I just kind of sit in my office and, and, and play um, candy crush or something. Um, so it's, it's this group of people that have really been the, the ones on the ground 
um, pushing all this research through. Um, some of them are here now. Um, so you're more than welcome to, uh, to thank them, even maybe buying the beer. Um, but again, it's, it's these guys that do all the hard work. So it's past and former research members. I'm not about. So I love, obviously, nothing more than talking about this. So if people have questions, um, sorry, I'm drinking. Um, I'm more than happy to entertain any questions or help in any way I can. Mm -hmm. The what? Biomarkers. The biomarkers. Was about to say that. Um, so that's still also a developing field, right? So he's asking about biomarkers. So um, that's a way to use, you know, other, uh, you know, say from blood, from urine, from um, cerebrospinal fluid, um, as a way to detect either, you know, uh, onset of Alzheimer's disease, um, how severe it's going to be, if you're going to get it. And so that's the main problem with Alzheimer's. Even if we had a perfect drug. Diagnosing the disease is so hard because usually you don't show symptoms and so you start showing memory decline. By the time you have severe enough memory decline, the physical damage is so severe it can't really be undone. So we want a way to, you know, at least get a sense. Okay, something bad's coming down the pipeline. If we take blood and look at phospho tau levels, if we look at amyloid levels, so there's an enormous amount of work being done in the field of biomarkers. I haven't seen anything come up that's reliable. Um, yeah. I mean, I, if you're interested more like the nuts and bolts, I can tell you what little I know, but um, yeah, I don't see anything I'm willing to fit money on yet. actually form, you know, like, you know, a, a little thumb drive of your memories, and then if you lose them, just, you know, reinstall. Um, so the short answer is not yet. However, in some sensory systems, they are doing some things like that. So for vision, there's a way to sort of um, take, you know, circuits, map it onto your visual cortex, and you might not have perfect visual acuity, but you can now see things that you couldn't see before because we're actually making circuits and hooking them up to your visual circuits, circuitry system. We're doing that in the auditory system, actually. That's actually been very nicely done. Um, the memory system, I think we're still trying to figure out how it works, and it's so distributed. So I talked about the hippocampus, and that's kind of like the, the first order of operations. And then it gets distributed somewhere else, and we don't really know where that, that is, um, to, to be certain. So like in, in theory, maybe it could be done on a small scale. Right, you'll need to form new memories, exactly. So you say once you lose the synapses, you lose those memories, but if there's a way to... Yeah, <laughs> but I mean, I would think there'd be a way, like, I'm trying to map it on that, what I know about sensory systems like that. neurobiology question. I think you're talking about patient HM. Yes, that, yes exactly. So he's a very famous patient back in the, my gosh, I forgot what year, 50s? Okay. Um, was, uh, had, had such severe epilepsy, they did a bitemporal lobectomy. So they basically took out what turned out to be much of his hippocampus and interrhinal cortex on both sides. Um, and what they found was um, his long-term memory, his memory from when he was a child a long time ago, was still intact, but he couldn't form any new memories. So you just want to stop and think about that for a minute. Like, every about three minutes, like, his, his, he, he'd reboot. He, he'd leave a room, come back in, he didn't, wouldn't remember seeing you three minutes ago. Um, and this is how he lived his life. And apparently he was a, you know, pretty easygoing, cheery person, um, but he only, he could talk about things from a long time ago, but he, you know, anything more than you know, weeks since his surgery was lost, and that's how they figured out. Uh, that's why it's like classic neurobiology, you know, first semester neuroscience. Um, the hippocampus and interrhinal cortex 
or sort of our memories are encoded. I try not to use too much jargon, encoding versus storage versus distribution. But memories are first encoded there. But then they get sent somewhere else for storage. And so where they get sent for storage is different than the hippocampus and entorhinal cortex. So that explains how some were kept and but the new ones were lost. So you're asking about like, the, the mouse models themselves, and do they spontaneously? No. So mice will never get Alzheimer's disease. Okay, so the mice that we're using, um, molecular biologists, like the gene doc that I was showing you, is really good at introducing human genes into a mouse genome. So basically, he could make mice that now express human genes. And then we just breed them normally, because now it's in their genome. So they're born with these mutations, and as they age, they'll start to show symptoms, but only because we force them to express the mutations. Um, and so we give the drug at various time points, um, depending upon what we want to look at. And we only gave the drugs for four weeks, because um, we just really just didn't want to spend six months treating an animal if it didn't work, <laughs> to be perfectly honest. So we did two time points. One, when there were very earliest stages of symptomology, what we're trying to do is, is replicate when in a human could you possibly even suspect they had Alzheimer's. And then another point we looked at was, this is when they would be diagnosed. So later stage, but they already have plaques, they already have tangles, they already have memory deficits. So we went for like what we were hoping for versus what we know really happened. And we saw benefits in both, but obviously the earlier you can give a drug, the better, which is why we need biomarkers. Mm. So I'll just repeat the question to people can hear. So he's asking, like, are we the only lab using this human you know, uh, neuron technology as a drug screening tool for Alzheimer's? So the short answer is, is no. There's not too many of them because one, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a technology that's being um, brought online more and more. Um, but, and a lot of the labs that are looking at it for terms of Alzheimer's are very molecular or, or protein-based or interested in the genes or even the proteins that they're spitting out. And that's definitely interesting and they're really good at it, we're really good at the synaptic physiology and calcium signaling, so that's where we're focusing on. So as far as I know, we're probably one of the, if there are any other labs that are very few looking at synaptic signaling, calcium signaling, network activity in human neurons for drug screen. There's a lot of caveats. No, that's right, right. So we're probably one of the very few that got this sort of custom built two photon imaging system um, designed just for this sort of thing. Hi, uh, yeah, I'd just like to thank you for, for coming out. I'm going to let me just stand to this side here so I don't get feedback. Um, so I'm a clinical neurologist. I have a lab here in one of the other universities in town here. And I um, thought your talk was excellent. Thanks for coming out. Um, one thing I thought was interesting was you mentioned uh, Robert Katzman, Bob Katzman, and, um, er, and uh, Dr. Terry as well in the context of the synapses. And I thought that was interesting because your work deals mainly with calcium signaling, but they were among the earliest proponents of the amyloid theory. And I guess the one point I would bring up is that some of the work, excellent work that you're doing may have more in common with their work than you would maybe want to admit. In particular, the connections, there's been a number of direct connections between 
various forms of, of A beta and calcium signaling, particularly in, in mitochondria, as you know. Um, and I guess the one point I'd, I'd make in that context is that amyloid or A beta isn't just one thing. It's not sort of generic like like beer. You know, like this beer that I was drinking, you know, was not Miller Lite. It was far better than that. And similarly, you know, there's a lot of forms of A beta that do different things. You know, there's monomers, there's oligomers, there's amylospheroids, and some of these have different effects. So I just would ask you what your thoughts are on potentially some of the connections between the prevalent theories in the field and what you're doing and what do you see as the future in the field and tying everything together. Thank you. That was an excellent question and thank you for opening that door. <laughs> um, I, I didn't want to get too tangled up in monomers, dimers, oligomers, but he's right. So you know, I, I speak of A beta as it's a single entity. Um, because I only had an hour, and I didn't, you know, I didn't know who I'm talking to in terms of, you know, biological complexity. Beta amyloid is actually a very complex protein series of structures or species, um, and so it's thought that a particular type of or grouping of amyloid um, oligomers, and there's many types of oligomers, and so there's a bunch of these A beta peptides clumped together. They are much more pathogenic or biologically active than some of those sticky plaques I was showing you, which are more sort of static and soluble things. I had figures, I'm actually glad, actually glad to show you, we do look at oligomers separately from insoluble A beta, um, but again, I was just trying to um, summarize for, for the group. So I do think A beta, and particularly oligomers, are active pathogenic species. Um, what we truly were trying to do is what's, ha like, what's chicken, what's egg, what's parallel pathways, and when do they converge? Um, so what we're finding is a lot of this calcium signaling abnormalities is happening before A beta oligomers emerge. So our first questions we wanted to try and um, get a good handle on is, are they parallel pathways? Is one causing the other? Or we tend to think, you know, you can introduce A beta oligomers into a healthy system and you can generate these sorts of calcium signaling abnormalities, or you have these um, disease models or the human cells where the calcium's happening first, but then we see the A beta oligomers come on board later. So I think one augments the other, and I see it as a, actually a pathogenic cycle. But you can stop the A beta oligomers, but all the other pathology is still gonna happen. You can stop the calcium abnormalities, and that seems to reduce the A beta the tau and a lot of things. So I think the calcium is upstream um, of, of a lot of the A beta oligomers, but certainly it makes it worse. And we know, um, I actually work closely with Ian Parker's lab, that's where I done my work at um, UC Irvine, where he was very nicely showing, he took all these different A beta species. So, you know, single peptide, two peptides, a bunch of peptides, a whole bunch of peptides, um, and then the insoluble form, and like which causes the sort of calcium signaling abnormalities. And it was only the A beta oligomers that induce this sort of calcium ab abnormality. So um, yes, and with Eliza Masley, actually I work with pretty closely, um, I, we were very um, supportive of each other in terms of you know, trying to get at the, the basis of what's driving this. But it's an excellent point. It's certainly more complicated. So for an hour, I would summarize. But anyone, yeah, I'm happy to, and we should probably talk more later um, to, to go into more. Yeah, so, I, so she's asking about you know, exercise as a sort of um, way to re reduce the, um, it doesn't mean you're not gonna get Alzheimer's, it's just one of the things that's you know, reduce the risk factors. And then diabetes, increase, you know, diabetes is associated with increase in, in Alzheimer's disease. What's the link? And to be honest, I don't have a direct answer for you. Um, a lot of it has to do with energy metabolism. Um, mitochondria were mentioned, um, sort of complex, metabolic activities of the cell. I know insulin, um, for example, insulin degrading enzymes are important in helping to clear A beta. And if that same insulin degrading enzymes is involved in the, you know, the, the breakdown of sugar, and I don't know if, if they are, but an insulin degrading enzyme, I'm guessing it probably is. So like that, that's an enzyme link. 
Um, but I think they're both metabolic stressors, which we know increase the likelihood of Alzheimer's. There are actually quite a few labs doing really nice work that could answer your question a lot better than I can. So it's the type of thing, if you really want an answer, I can point you to the people that can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, we're in North Chicago. So not, not downtown, but in the suburbs. So. Mm -hmm. That's a really great idea. <laughs> and I'm not laughing because it's, it's we, we talk about this in terms of sharing data and consolidating databases. And the Alzheimer's Association has actually been very good at helping with that. Um, so there are certain uh, coordinated centers that will compile all of their information and make it publicly available. Um, all of our studies are posted on a publicly available website called PubMed. Um, Certainly anything that's NIH funded is made freely available to the public. It's written in science ease. Um, but again, there's, there's um, resources and foundations that synthesize this information for general audience um, availability. So if you're interested in something in particular, I'll be happy to like, see if I can help you find uh, others. Mm -hmm. missing anything. We need to read a lot. We spend a lot of time reading other people's papers and going to meetings. But actually dissemination of information and, and um, validating other studies and, and looking for supporting links is actually really important. It's actually, I wouldn't say it's called a problem. It's, um, it's something we struggle with to try and optimize. Because scientists, we all work in our own kind of little furloughs, and there will be networks of information, but it doesn't necessarily know what's going on in your network. And it's not until it's publicly available that a published paper uh, presented at a meeting, put on a publicly available database, do we at least have access to that information? Why would we start a private company? Well, for something that we want to advance quickly that particularly requires um, an influx of funding um, that we need to say push through, like to get a drug pushed through even through the early, earliest stages of um, FDA approval requires um, far more money than, say, the NIH would necessarily give us in a single grant, and the criteria are different. Um, so for the, N the NIH, when I started funding my, this type of work very recently, it was the Alzheimer's Association, private foundations um, that were, were funding this sort of development work, because it's rather high risk, um, potentially high reward, but not in the NIH's comfort zone to fund. They, they're the ones that will often give a lot more money. Um, so forming a company allowed us a lot more latitude to be able to try and raise these funds to say we're trying to get you know, a new therapeutic approach for Alzheimer's through the door. We need a more um, aggressive and uh, flexible type of approach to do this. And we think the problem and is critical enough and we really think we've hit on at least a mechanism that is really at the crux of why these memories are being lost. I mean, we need a different, a different tool. Um, so basically, so typically, um, see venture capitalists, private investors, even drug companies. Um, the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation um, will, has invested in, in this company. So it can come from any sort of you know, private donor or venture capitalist. You should really be talking to Glenn. Um, he can give a much better answer. I'm in the lab crunching numbers. Um, but that's, that's the sort of, again, it literally can be from anyone, but there are groups that invest in these sorts of you know, high-risk companies um, you know, we're, we're trying to attract funding from. So it, it's partially some of it the NIH, but largely industry. So big drug, drug companies are really the only ones that have that sort of dollar power. Um, the NIH had put quite a bit of money into several of those compounds, and for those of us in the Alzheimer's field, at least at the basic science ground level, we really felt it because all the money 
that typically would have been put towards basic research got redirected to clinical trials or sort of larger scale clinical um, studies. Um, and for many years, we were left with funding rates of you know, 3%. You know, really, really tiny. So, where foundations came in and really helped, you know, fill the gaps. So, uh, she's from the Alzheimer's Association. Um, help, help fill those gaps. So, yeah, it, it, we, we felt the hit at the NIH um, about you know funding Alzheimer's disease from the, the basic research side because um, it went to those clinical trials. In part. question, right? So these fibroblasts, and what we haven't done is actually looked at the fibroblast phenotypes. We don't know what they look like, but I'm presuming they have some degree of calcium signaling. What we don't know, for example, is like how highly expressed those calcium channels are. I'm thinking they're probably not in fibroblasts that much, but when we convert them into neurons and turn on those genes that are neuron genes, these calcium channels pop up a lot more aggressively. So that's my guess that we are, as a matter of fact, John, John can do that experiment tomorrow for you. Um, uh, so that's what we think. And then uh, aging. Um, so how do we take into account aging in these you know, human neurons in a dish? And actually, what's really interesting is if you take skin cells, bring it back to an induced pluripotent stem cell, so sort of go back to when it's like a baby, baby cell, and then make it come forward and change into a neuron, um, you lose some of the, the, the phenotype. You lose some of the, called the epigenetics, the stuff that controls the genes in the DNA. However, if you take a skin cell and then go straight to a neuron, you keep those, um, that epigenetic information. You keep a lot of that. And then if you take the skin cell from an old, you know, an aged person, it will have and retain many of those characteristics. There is an outstanding paper by Rust, from Rusty Gage's group that looked at exactly that question. So I can forward you that paper if you're interested. We looked at you know, young skin cells, or young cells, old cells, direct conversion, indirect conversion, what gets kept and what gets lost, and it was, it was fascinating. So the fact that you can take skin cell from an aged person, turn it into a neuron from an aged person, and it acts and it has a different genetic protein and functional um, phenotype, you know, uh, outline, then the same thing done to a young cell. And again, it's all the things you would predict. So that's, that's a really tough question. You must be one of my reviewers. <laughs> um, so we don't know exactly what's causing the um, calcium signal. I mean, a couple things, yes. We're, okay, so the, the short answer is I'm not sure. I have a couple good guesses. Yeah. But since we're interested in what, since we know what happens, we're interested in what's happening after that. But we do need to know what's upstream. So um, since you asked, I'll, I'll make you listen to me. <laughs> um, we know that one of the mutations that cause the familial Alzheimer's, I mentioned presenilla mutation, it's in the same organelle as this calcium channel. And this protein normally regulates this calcium channel. So when you mutate it, it, it changes how, how this calcium channel operates. But that only explains like five to 10% um, of the cases. We know in sporadic Alzheimer's disease, we also see this sort of calcium dysregulation. Granted, it comes on later, it's not as profound. And I'm thinking other insults come in, um, and actually I, I do know this, we just haven't done the experiment, but like A-beta oligomers causes calcium dyshomeostasis and a lot of it gets taken up by the endoplasmic reticulum in the mitochondria, and now it's driving its own calcium dyshomeostasis. And then it becomes sort of a self-fulfilling pro prophecy and it goes around and around. So that, that helps. Uh, can you uh, speak uh, to the Yes, is Alyssa here? <laughs> so Alyssa is my graduate student who's working on exactly that question. So there's special um, neuroimmune cells in the brain called microglia that become activated. And you see them all around the plaques, you see them in, um, and we see them activated in our fairly young mouse models. And we know that the calcium signaling among the microglia 
um, forms these very odd pathways. They just sort of spontaneously start releasing calcium and it's forming these networks of activated microglia. Um, so we know like a little bit of an immune response is good, but too much becomes um, maladaptive, and we think that's what's happening. So there was some thought that uh, anti-inflammatory medicines, such as ibuprofen or Advil, might have some therapeutic value because it was reducing inflammation in the brain in part through these activated microglia. Um, so we know that we said we were just starting up a, a project in the lab um, where this a little field. Um, we'll be doing our thesis hopefully on that. So check in in a couple of years, you might have an interesting. But there, there's a actually pretty um, uh, strong, um, several strong re lab, research labs looking into that exact sort of question. So, okay. All right, well, so thank you guys for your attention. Um, I loved it. Any more questions? Let me know. I need a beer, I talk. <laughs>